with King George III, lustful for power, but plagued with periodic fits of insanity. He is trying to rule his kingdom. The Townsend Acts had failed to produce revenue. In one year, they had netted only 295 pounds. The annual military budget for the colonies had amounted to 170,000 pounds. The Townsend duties were therefore repealed, except for the three pence tax on tea. Increasing numbers of colonials were reluctantly paying the tea tax because the legal tea was now cheaper than the smuggled tea and cheaper than their fellow Englishmen were paying for tea in England. Well, why should they be turn of evil, turn of evil, turn of evil, turn of events? In 1773, come on. In 1773, the British East India Company was overburdened with 17 million pounds of unsold tea and was facing bankruptcy. Parliament decided to assist the company by awarding it a complete monopoly of the American tea business. That meant no other tea company could sell to the American colonies. They had a virtual monopoly. Excuse me. The terms thus granted would enable the giant corporation to sell the coveted tea more cheaply than ever before. To the colonists, though, it seemed like a shabby attempt to trick the Americans with the bait of cheaper tea into accepting the detestable tax. And here a... Um, placard a uh, sign that was put up brethren and fellow citizens you may depend that those odious miscreants and detestable tools of ministry and governor the tea consignees those traitors to their country butchers who have done and are doing everything to murder and destroy all that shall stand in the way of their private interests oh good heavens murderers because they simply want to buy the tea are determined to come and reside again in the town of boston I therefore give you this early notice that you may hold yourselves in readiness on the shortest notice to give them such a reception as such vile ingrates deserve. Joyce June, Chairman of the Committee for Tiring and Feathering. If any person should be so hardy as to tear this down, they may expect my fervent resentment. J. June. Yes, don't you even think of taking down this notice. Not a single one of the several thousand chests of tea shipped by the company ever reached the hands of the consignees. At Annapolis, the Marylanders burned both the cargo and the vessel. What happened here was absolutely horrible. The gentleman who the gentleman who was bringing in the tea, Mr. Stewart, he was caught attempting to find a reasonable solution to the tea tax in the past. Maryland's provincial government had established a non-importation resolution designed to prevent tea from being imported, unloaded, and sold in the colony of Maryland. But defying that, on October 15, 1774, the ship, the Peggy Stewart, sailed into the Annapolis Harbor with a load of 17 packages containing 2,320 pounds of tea. 
Handbills were immediately circulated throughout the city calling for a public meeting. This Peggy Stewart, that's the name of the ship, was owned by a British loyalist named Anthony Stewart. Now, loyalist means he's loyal to the king. God saved the king. Patriots were wanting to break from the king, defy all the rules, and then a good percentage of Americans were indifferent, but he was, an, he was a loyalist. He was deeply in debt due to previous questionable money-making schemes, and this may explain why he took the gamble of bringing the tea to Annapolis. He had purchased the ship a year before and had decided to bring this tea over despite Maryland's declaring it um, banned. On October 19, 1774, a public meeting of a great number of very respectable gentlemen was held. In his defense, Stewart stated that he knew nothing about the tea shipment and that it was placed on the Peggy Stewart without his permission by his London agents. While the tea was ordered before the non-importation agreement went into effect, it is doubtful that Stewart, though, was unaware of the order. Stewart emphasized that no passenger or cargo of his could be brought ashore until all the cargo was declared and all duties and taxes were paid. With this, Stewart tried to justify his actions as that of a humanitarian who cared deeply for the several crew members and 53 indentured servants who were aboard the Peggy Stewart. Although... He claimed innocence. His actions were dis discarded. Angry participants wanted to burn Stewart's warehouse or business, while others shouted the motto, liberty or death. As, a, as the situation worse, worsened, a gallows was erected in front of his house. A leader of the mob Dr. Charles Warfield stood before the house and ordered Stuart two options. You must either go with me and apply the torch to your own vessel or hang before your own door. Due to the imminent danger to his life and fear for the safety of his young daughter and pregnant wife, he quickly agreed to burn the Peggy Stuart and the tea. The 36-year-old Stuart rode through the waters and then and then volunteer and then voluntarily set fire to the tea in a few hours the whole together with the vessel was consumed in the presence of a great number of spectators during the burning of his own ship stuart was subsequently burned in effigy to burn someone in effigy means you can't actually burn them, but you make a dummy of them, probably put their name on the dummy, and then you burn the dummy as if you were burning the person. That's burning an effigy, hanging an effigy. Um, the loss of the Peggy Stewart was devastating to Stewart and his business. Eventually, he left Annapolis and moved back to England and then later to Nova Scotia. Some members of the Maryland gentry still hoped for reconciliation with Great Britain. Diplomatic efforts were quickly proving ineffective, though. Moderates like Thomas Stone found the agenda more and more being determined by the lower classes who accepted mob violence, advocated war, and promoted independence. So the gentry want things to be calm and peaceful. They want good relations with England, but the masses do not. Meanwhile, at Boston on November 27th, 1773, the first British ship arrived loaded with tea. The Patriots would not let the ship unload, but the governor would not let the ship leave without paying the Townsend tax. The ruling back then, if you sailed into the harbor, you could not leave the harbor until you paid the taxes. 
Well, the problem was the East India Company was going bankrupt and they said, hey, we cannot pay the taxes because we have no money. We were planning on selling the tea to merchants here in Boston. And once they paid us, we would pay our tax and sail on. An impasse existed for 20 days. And then the British officials decided to seize the ship for refusal to pay the duties. Well, on December 16, 1773, to prevent the seizure, 200 colonists disguised as Indians boarded the three ships and smashed open 342 chests and dumped the cursed weed into the harbor. A silent crowd watched approvingly from the wharves as salty tea was brewed for the fishes. No, it was not one ship at the Boston Tea Party. It was three ships loaded with tea that they destroyed. Disguised as Indians, I am sure that the people on the shore knew exactly who was on those ships. And while they stood watching and not participating, they were probably thinking to themselves, oh, there goes my neighbor. He's disguised as an Indian. But when the question, they all said, we have no idea who those were. It was a pack of wild Indians. Well, it just so happened that two very well-known uh, Bostonians were among those 200 who were putting the tea into the sea. And that was Paul Revere and John Hancock. We, of course, will know Paul Revere from the poem that was written about the Midnight Ride and John Hancock. He is the signer on both the Declaration of Independence and on our new Constitution that will be created. And on the Declaration of Independence, he said, I am going to sign my name large enough that King George III doesn't have to put his spectacles on to see my name. And so that's why oftentimes people will say, put your John Hancock on this piece of paper. Well, he was a well-known um, merchant in the town there, and... He was a major smuggler. Ha <laughs> ha. So much for being a law-abiding citizen. Reaction to the Boston Tea Party varied. Many felt that the wanton destruction of private property was going too far. Fine. You want to non not buy. Non-importation is one thing. You don't have to buy, but you have the right to destroy the British East India Company's private property. The British at home were outraged. These are the British back in England. Even Friends of America hung their heads. Parliament acted swiftly in the spring of 1774. Punitive measures, that means to punish Punish measures were put into place against the colonists. The British called them the coercive acts. To coerce means to use force to change the course of, to change the opinion of, to change the mind of. They said we are trying to um, for force you, coerce you to behave. The colonists, though, called them the intolerable acts. And what were the intolerable acts? First of all, Governor Hutchison was replaced by General Gage. Remember, the anti-British sentiment was misplaced on Governor Hutchison, who was simply trying to make the colonists do what the king had ordered. And we trashed his house earlier. We talked about that. Well, the civil government is replaced by General Gage, the military man. And all of Massachusetts was put under military control. 
When you are under military control, all the rules change. You're under military law, not civilian law. Secondly, the port of Boston was closed until the colonists paid for the tea. This, of course, created great economic hardship. You want to destroy the tea? Fine. You now own it, and you will pay for it. The port is closed. Well, the main way of life that Bostonians had was because of their trading, their harbor there. And so suddenly there will be no trading. No goods will come in. No goods will come out until you pay for that tea. So great economic hardship. Third, the Administration of Justice Act. Any British official or soldier, <coughs> excuse me, accused of a capital crime, that means a crime that could result in the death penalty, could be transferred to Britain or another colony for a fair trial. In Boston, would a British soldier receive a fair trial? No. Instead, he could go to another colony than the very agitated Massachusetts, or he could even request his trial to be held back in England. And witnesses who are accusing him would have to testify and travel to wherever that other location is. If you are a farmer, a shopkeeper, someone who lives in Boston, the time it would take to travel to another colony, the time it would take to travel to England to testify would make it more likely that you would probably not bother to go, therefore the charges would be dropped. The colonial impact, colonists now had no leverage over the unlawful actions of British officials who now occupied most major offices. Why do they occupy most major offices? Because we are under martial military rule, not civilian rule. And fourth, now, from now on, town meetings would not be held without the military government's consent. In New England, town meetings were a common way of life. Anytime the people were riled up, they would call a town meeting. Anyone was able to, who, who wanted to attend was able to and could speak their mind. Now you get riled up, up about what's going on. You have to ask the military government's consent. And are they likely to want to let you rabble-rousers gather for a town meeting? No, they could simply deny you the right to town meetings. Fifth, before the upper house was elected by the lower house, now the governor could appoint the upper house. And sixth, all colonial governors were given the power to quarter troops up to 24 hours on private property. With all these extra troops having been sent to Boston, we needed places to house them. And so that was the purpose for the Quartering Act. Cartoon of the time period. The female combatants. I love this one. Oh, I love this one. And here you have... England, the mother country, dressed as a very fine maiden, aristocrat, and her shield says, for obedience, we need our colonies to be obedient. And the 13 original colonies here, dressed as an Indian maiden, and the shield <laughs> with a chicken, <laughs> chicken on their shield, and it says, for liberty. And the fair maiden England says, I'll force you to obedience, you rebellious slut. Ooh, cheeky. And the American colonists retaliate with, 
Liberty, liberty forever, forever mother, while I exist. And so the cuffs are on, and the colonists and the mother country are going to go at it. Well, leaving no time to get things quieted down, the Quebec Act was passed at the same time, and it was erroneously regarded in English-speaking America as one of the repressive measures, one of the intolerable acts. It was not. It was separate. The French were guaranteed the Catholic religion and the old boundaries of the province of Quebec were now extended southward all the way to the Ohio River. So previously, when we discussed the um, proclamation line and the creation of Quebec as a separate colony, whereas many of these New England colonies had felt this was land they could move into and the creation of East and West Florida, now suddenly we go from this area above the Great Lakes, the Quebec, all the way down to the Ohio River. So they've gone from being up here to expanding, greatly expanding the area of the Quebec colony. So all this land to the west that Americans planned to move into <clears throat> was now off limits. In addition, it also allowed French Canadians to use their own legal system, which did not recognize trial by jury. One of those rights that we had for centuries as Englishmen considered most dear. And it was felt that the purpose was to keep us out of all this wonderful territory. It aroused a host of anti-Catholics who were shocked by the extension of Roman Catholic jurisdiction southward into a huge region that had once been earmarked for Protestantism. American dissenters, outraged by the Quebec Act, responded sympathetically to the plight of poor Massachusetts. Flags were flown at half-mast throughout the colonies on the day the port of Boston was closed. Flying your flag at half-mast, that is an indication that some tragedy has happened and the nation is in recognition of that tragedy. Well, here the 13 original colonies are saying Poor Boston up in Massachusetts has died. The port has been closed. And the Union Jack is flying at half-mast. The English flag for hundreds of years has been known as the Union Jack. And it was because they were one sovereign nation, including England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. Ireland. So the Union, the Union Jack. Sister colonies rallied to send food to the stricken city of Boston. Rice was shipped even from far away South Carolina. Most memorable of all responses to the intolerable acts was the summoning of the Continental Congress in 1774. It was to meet in Philadelphia to consider ways of redressing colonial grievances. Were they going to declare independence? No. They were going to discuss how can we patch things up with England. Twelve of the thirteen colonies, with Georgia alone missing, sent 55 delegates. And at that time, Georgia was the last colony to be founded and one of the weakest. Among the delegates were Samuel Adams and John Adams. They are cousins. 
George Washington and Patrick Henry. So all four of these are leading uh, colonial and once we are independent, major leaders in the United States. Well, Boston is cooped up. Nothing can happen until the tax on tea is paid. At night on April 18th, 1775, this is the next year, April 1775, 700 British soldiers head to Concord. So they're all cooped up here in Boston, the soldiers, and they are going to go up here to Concord. The colonists were not sitting by doing nothing. In every town along, around, um, in Massachusetts, the Colonists were creating groups called Minutemen with the idea that within a minute's notice that you have been warned, you will have your musket and you will be ready to defend hearth and home. They would practice military drills and shooting on the commons. Every town had an area at the center of town that was an open field. There was usually some type of courthouse or church or that ser served dual purposes, a uh, type of building on usually one end of the common, but there was all this open space and anyone could do anything on the common. You could graze your cattle, you could um, let your pigs run, you could um, let your chickens out there, um, or you could have a picnic. You could do whatever you wanted. It was common for everyone area. And the colonists had been practicing getting ready should force be necessary. So the soldiers were going to, 700 soldiers were going to leave Boston and come up here to Concord. The colonists had stockpiled munitions, that is, musket balls, um, gunpowder, weaponry in Concord should conflict break out. They could spread that weaponry all over wherever, wherever it would be necessary. This is a problem for the British who are landlocked almost like on an island down here in Boston, that all these munitions are up here. And so the British say, general says, we're gonna go up here and we're going to take away from you all these stockpiled munitions. And from there we get the famous Paul Revere's Ride poem from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the 18th of April in 75. Hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said his friend to his he said to his friend, if the British march by land or sea in the town tonight, hang a lantern aloft at the belfry arch of the North Church Tower as a signal light, one if by land and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be, ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm. At this time, we were aware that the British were going to do something. And jo Dr. Joseph Warren had gotten information and he had a two-person plan figured out. First of all, William Dawes would head out by land here and come up and warn <clears throat> Two of the ringleaders, John Hancock and Samuel Adams, who were up here in Lexington, warned them because the British were hoping to bag them. They are two ringleaders. Let's get them out of the way and then go on to Concord and get the supplies. So one if by land, two if by sea. And Paul Revere is supposed to be over here 
waiting for the Old North Church to put out this signal, um, one if by land, two if by, maybe one if by land, two, I think this is supposed to be land and this would be if they went by sea. And then once he knows, he is to set out. Now, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem never mentions William Dawes. He gets no credit for any of this because his name didn't rhyme in the poem, is part of it. And that old North Church. Every church has to have a tall steeple, and so back then there was only very low buildings. This would have been able to be seen for a long distance, and so you're to go up here and with your lanterns, you're to let me know how they are coming. He said good night. And with muffled oar, silently rowed to the Charleston shore. So Paul Revere rolls over here and gets on his horse. He is waiting on the Charleston shore to know which way do I tell them the British are coming. Just as the moon rose over the bay, where swinging wide at her moorings lay, their Somerset British man o' war, a phantom ship with each mast and spar, across the moon like a prison bar, and a huge bulk, black bulk that was magnified by its own reflection in the tide. Meanwhile, his friend through alley and street wanders and watches with eager ears, till in the silence around him he hears the muster of men at the barracks door, the sound of arms and the tramp of feet, and the measured tread of the grandeliers marching down to their boats on the shore. So he hears the British, they are tramping down to the shore. So apparently this is one if by, um, two if by sea. I guess going around this way would have been land. Then he climbed the tower to the old north church by the wooden stairs with stealthy tread to the belfry chamber overhead and startled the pigeons from their perch on the somber rafters that round him made masses and moving shapes of shade to the trembling ladder steep and tall to the highest window in the wall. There he paused to listen and look down a moment on the roofs of the town and the moonlight flowing over all. Beneath in the churchyard lay the dead in their night encampment on the hill, wrapped in silence so deep and still that he could hear, uh, like a sentinel's tread, the watchful night wing as it went, creeping along from tent to tent and seeming to whisper, all is well. A moment only he feels the spell of the place of, and the hour of, and the secret dread of the lonely belfry and the dead. For suddenly all his thoughts are bent on a shadowy something far away where the water widens to meet the bay, a line of black that bends and floats like a rising t on the rising tide like a bridge of boats. So they're going over by sea. Meanwhile, impatient to mount and ride, boot booted and spurred with a heavy stride on the opposite shore walked Paul Revere. Da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. Now he patted his horse's side. Now he gazed at the landscape far and near. Then impetus stamped the earth and turned and tightened his saddle girth. But mostly he watched with eager search the belfry tower of the old north church as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and somber and still. And lo, as he looks on the belfry height, a glimmer and then a gleam of light. He springs to the saddle, the bridle he turns, but lingers and gazes till full in his sight, a second lamp in the belfry burns. Remember, one if by land, two if by sea, a second lamp burns, a hurry of hoofs in the village street, a shape in the moonlight, a bulk in the dark, and beneath from the pebbles and passing a spark, struck out by a steed flying fearless and fleet, that is all, and yet through the gloom and the light, the fate of a nation was riding that night, and the spark struck out by that steed in his flight, kindled the land into flame with its heat, he has left the village and mounted the steep, and beneath him, tranquil and broad and deep, is the mystic meeting the 
ocean tides and under the Adlers that skirt its edge, now soft on the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp of his steed as he rides. It was twelve by the village clock when he crossed the bridge into Medford town. So he's gone from Charleston up here to Medford town. He heard the crowing of the cock and the barking of the farmer's dog and felt the damp of the river fog that rises after the sun goes down. It was one by the village clock when he gallops into Lexington. Lexington, oh, famous Lexington. He saw the gilded weathercock swim in the moonlight as he passed, and the meeting house windows, black and bare, gaze at him with a spectral glare, as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. Here at Lexington, another famous poem, the shot heard round the world, the British regulars come into the common. And they are all shoulder to shoulder, and there is a group of townspeople that have gathered. And the British tell them, get, <laughs> disband, we are coming through. And they don't get. And so shots are fired, and we have our first casualties. Now, at this stage... Dawes arrives at Lexington about half hour after Paul Revere. Paul Revere has already warm, warned Samuel Adams and John Hancock, hey, they're after you, get out of town. So the British are unable to bag themselves those two key patriots. It was two o'clock by the village clock when he came to the bridge in Concord town. Ah, let me stop there again. Once they get to Lexington, Paul Revere and William Dawes are headed off to Concord. They are joined at this stage by Samuel Prescott. Prescott lives in Concord. And he has come over to visit his girlfriend. And it's late at night now, and he's leaving to go back to Concord. And he says, I will accompany you. I live there. I know um, where I'm going. Well, it just so happens that on their way to Concord, they are beset upon by British soldiers and Paul Revere is captured and spends his night in the British garrison, in the pokey in jail. And William Dawes takes off, and he actually falls off his horse and hurts his leg and makes it back to Lexington. It is Samuel Prescott who jumps over a huge hurdle and escapes into the forest who actually makes it to Concord and warns people before the British get there. Well, I thought it was a midnight ride of Paul Revere. What about Dawes? What about Prescott? Prescott is the only one that makes it to Concord. Now, did he start out in Boston? No, but the two that were supposed to make it all the way to Concord, neither one of them make it. Oh, how funny how history changes, depending upon who writes the poem. It was two by the village clock when he came to the bridge in Concord town. He heard the bleeding of the flock and the twitter of the birds among the trees and felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadow brown. And one was safe and asleep in his bed, who at the bridge would be first to fall, who that day would be lying dead, pierced by a British musket ball. And yes, the bridge to go into Concord is where fighting will actually occur and there will be casualties as the colonists try and refuse the British the right to come into Concord.
You know the rest in the books you have read, how the British regulars fired and fled, how the farmers gave them ball for ball from behind each fence and farmyard wall, chasing the redcoats down the lane and crossing the fields to emerge again under the cre trees at the turn of the road and only pausing to fire and load. So what you have going on here is, yes, the British made it to Concord. Yes, they got our stuff. They got our munitions. But the big problem was the British had to get back to Boston. And all the Minutemen, all the colonists are now, it is daylight, and they are ready. And as those British are going in formation, left, right, left, right, in regiments down the road, the colonists are not coming out and standing in the middle of the road in columns to fight them, European warfare style. No, they are fighting Indian warfare style. They're behind buildings, they're behind rocks, they're behind trees, and pew, pew, while being very difficult to fire back upon, they are picking these redcoats off left and right on their way back to Boston. So through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm, a cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. For born in the night wind of the past, through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will listen it will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed in the midnight passage of Paul Revere. Now, we must give some reason other than his name rhymed for why Paul Revere was put into the poem. One reason was that he had left some pretty detailed records of what had transpired that evening. And those were about the only records that were available to the public, to anyone, to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Um, Dawes seems to have gone into oblivion, so did Prescott. Very little is known particularly about Prescott after that one night. Some 2,000 English troops were finally involved in the trek back to Boston. The British suffered heavily in the trip back, 72 deaths and about 182 wounded for a total casualty rate of 254. The colonists, meanwhile, yes, they had casualties as well. The first on the Lexington Green, uh, about eight colonists were struck down. The colonists had a total of 93 casualties, and casualties include deaths as well as wounded. The British use of force was based on a misreading of American temperament. They felt that the colonists would cower in the face of arms. Did the colonists cower? No, it only made them angrier and gave more credence to that conspiracy theory. <laughs> Remember that conspiracy theory? You sniffing it out? <laughs> England has lost her liberties and now she is trying to take the colonial's liberties, even if it means by force. And we will draft George Washington in our next segment.